morning, everyone. Welcome. So glad you are here with us this morning to worship with us today. A uh, couple of little pieces of housekeeping before we get started with the service uh, proper. Just a few announcements. Uh, first thing, if and I promise you we're not going to embarrass you. We just got a little connection card to hand to you. If this is your first time here, just raise your hands and our ushers will bring you um, a connection card and uh, we can have them fill that out. We've got one here and uh, we'll make sure you get one, ma'am, before, before we, we close out today. Um, on a sad note, we do have a remembrance service, a celebration of life service here for Clifford Fields here at the chapel on the 22nd of June. Uh, 1500, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, visitation is going to start at 1400. So our prayers are with the Fields family as they're grieving. Uh, and then his interment will be uh, at Arlington uh, at a later date. Um, we've been announcing for the last couple of weeks, we need to make this again clear, that today's offering is a designated offering for the Tun, Ta Tun Tavern Fellowship, which is a, a ministry, a Christian ministry, uh, targets primarily the Marine Corps. Um, I don't know, John, are you able to, dis you familiar with it enough to describe it a little bit to everyone for us, or? Okay, yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. Sun Tavern Fellowship is a, a, a global uh, organization that basically is uh, missionaries to the Marine Corps. Um, it basically began out of Officers Christian Fellowship, provides um, scholarships to retreat centers, uh, lots of discipleship at each of the bases and stations, and uh, it provides basically a place for the spiritual fitness um, in, uh, in, in uh, since everyone else, you know, very focused on physical fitness. So, uh, yeah, part of been, I've been part of the board of directors for uh, 16 years, and um, it's been a great ministry. So, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you. Yeah, so anything you put in the offering plate this morning will be going to uh, Tun Tavern Fellowship. If you would prefer to give just to the general chapel ties and offerings fund, uh, we would ask that you take advantage of our digital giving option. Uh, you can use the QR code, that little, that little square dealy right there uh, in your bulletin and uh, give that way if you prefer the, your donation to go to the, uh, the general fund. Uh, and then also today is our chapel volunteer appreciation reception over at Woodlawn Chapel. That's going to take place fairly, fairly uh, uh, quickly after the conclusion of our service today. It'll start at 1300, run to 1500, and you can find some bulletins there in, or some details there in the bulletin. Are there any other announcements that I have failed to make that I'm not tracking? Yes. Yep. All right. And then with that, I'm going to step aside for just a minute and let Chaplain Brooks come up for a moment. And um, we have a, a bittersweet moment today. Good morning, Chapel family. If we can have the Dalby family come up, including McKenna. Hopefully our AV system won't fall apart while you're coming up here. Uh, and uh, it's going to be, indeed, bittersweet. Uh, really appreciate uh, John and Liesl and, and the whole family. Really, um, they're all plugged in. And uh, not only have they been a, uh, just interpersonally, a spiritual blessing to our Chapel family, uh, they have given a lot of volunteer service in some very needed areas. Uh, uh, probably the one that's harder to take care of is the audiovisual because I don't understand it myself. But I'm thankful that there are people who volunteer their time and their expertise to, to uh, take care of that. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, they've helped with the intercessory prayer John has. Uh, they've helped with the, both the children's choir and the adult choir. They've helped uh, in Sunday school. They've helped in Awana, uh, Children's Church. I don't know. Was anything anything I'm leaving out? That's that's. Uh, it's hard for me to keep all this in oh, mind. Care groups. Thank care you. Care, yeah. care groups. Yeah. All right. Yes, there was something I, I left out. So um, I'm going to let. Um, and we got a token of appreciation. In fact, I'll present that oh, now. Thank you. It's a, uh, the, the drawing that Evelyn made of the chapel, Evelyn Porter, and uh, framed uh, for them so they can always remember us and then put on their wish list to come back here again to Fort Belvoir. So. I'm going to let John share a few words about what uh, he's done as, as an assignment here, where they're going next, and anything else that God puts on his heart. 
Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you so much, Body. Uh, we are from our very first Sunday here. There were several ways that God affirmed that this is where He wanted us to worship. And uh, just over the past two and a half years, it's been a true blessing for us to get to know each and every one of you, uh, to be able to cry together, laugh together, worship together, um, and just get to know each other. There's um, just, it's been a joy for me especially that this body has given our whole family a means to serve. Because I, I really do believe that, you know, church and chapel community is a, it's not just what you receive from the leadership. It's not just what you receive from the, the sermon, but it's also uh, how we can give and serve our, our, uh, our Lord and Savior. And so each of our kids have found a way to be able to do that, and thank you for uh, allowing us to be part of that. We're leaving um, SOCOM at the Pentagon, where I've been working for the past two and a half years, going to Hawaii, where I'll be working with um, a third Marine littoral regiment out there. Uh, but we certainly are sad to leave this body, and look, but we do know that God will uh, send others um, and you will welcome them in, and that we will also be able to find other fellowship where we're going. So thank you very much from all of us. Uh, we love you and look forward to crossing paths again in the future. And before you step down, I want to take a moment to pray for you. Guys, this family, I cannot speak highly enough of them. Uh, the very first people we met when we moved into our house... Uh, were the Dalbys, and they, from that moment, they embraced us, uh, and they have ministered to us in our need on more occasions than I can even remember, and we are going to miss them terribly. Their dedication to the work of the kingdom puts me to shame at times. Uh, we always call them honorary chaplains, and, uh, and we'll just kind of overlook the fact that they're Marines. Well, you know, there is grace. Uh, but uh, we are very, very sad, even on a very personal level, to, uh, to lose you guys. Uh, we, just, we love you, love you dearly. Semper Fi, guys. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful, godly family, um, for John and Liesel and their beautiful children, and we pray your rich and abundant blessing on them as they depart from us. Uh, prepare a ministry for them where they, where they are headed to in Hawaii. Give them a home and a, a church family there that will embrace them and minister to them as they have ministered to so many here. Father, use them to continue to build your kingdom and uh, glorify you in all that they do. Send them away now, Lord, with our, uh, our deepest love and our, uh, our eternal gratitude for all that they have done for everyone here. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so our call to worship this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the heavens, but not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, includes the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather as your people today to worship you and learn of you, and we ask that you would sanctify us through the truth of your word and our fellowship with your people. 
Be glorified in us today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now I invite you to stand if you're able uh, and join us in our opening hymn, hymn number 633, Open Our Eyes, Lord. We exalt you, O Lord our God. We worship at your footstool and kneel before you, our maker. Teach us to love you as you have commanded us to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Teach us to obey your statutes and your commandments, for that is how we show you our love. We worship and adore you for all you have done for us and who you are and, for who you can, and how you continue to work in our lives. Be glorified in our worship today and teach us to pray as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now take a moment to greet those around you and uh, wish them the peace of Christ. peace of Christ be with you all as you return to your seats. Now as you take your seats, I'd invite you to uh, join with me and our fellow Christians around the world and throughout the ages as we offer our answer to, to uh, this question. Christian, what do you believe? 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me now for a prayer of intercession, confession of sin, and assurance of pardon. Almighty and merciful God, we are lost without you and in great need. So many in our congregation are grieving or ill or anxious. Remind us, Lord, of your goodness and your greatness and of your never-ending, never-failing love. Help us to see that you are sufficient for all of our heartaches and cares, that you walk beside us through all of them, giving your strength to us. We ask especially that you would be with and comfort the Tilly family, the Walker family, the Fields family, as they mourn those they love. Surround them with your peace. For the many in our congregation who are ill, we ask that you would bring healing and perseverance, that you would show yourself faithful. And undoubtedly, Lord, there are countless other needs and struggles we are unaware of, but we can take comfort in knowing that you know them all. So we lift them before you and ask that you who are good and merciful and strong enough to carry them would do just that, and that you would give your people rest. Father, we pray now for your people everywhere that you would give victory over the sin that sorely hinders us. As you have washed us with your shed blood, cleanse us of our sin, free us from its consequences. Make us indeed righteous in our thoughts and words and actions. We acknowledge our daily failure and wait with eagerness the coming of the day when we stand complete and holy before you by the work you have done in us. And so we confess our sin before you, Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for the freedom that you have given us through the death, the life, the death, and resurrection of your Son. But we confess today that we often live like slaves. Instead of living like you delight in us, we avoid you in shame and guilt. Instead of receiving your favor as a gift, we try to earn it with our efforts. Instead of accepting your freedom, we prefer our chains. Instead of pursuing your purposes, we cling to our short-sighted agendas. Forgive us, embrace us, cleanse us, and heal us. And now, uh, a moment for each to silently confess their own sin before God. Father, teach us to truly repent of our sins that your promises may be fulfilled. That as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great are your mercies for those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our wrongdoings from us. Give us joy in the knowledge that as, your, as our faith is in you to save us and not in our own worthiness, then we stand forgiven before you because of the death and resurrection of Christ. In his name we pray and thank you for our salvation. Amen. And in response to that forgiveness, let's stand and sing hymn number 43, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Father, in your grace, you've given generously to us to meet our needs. So we ask that you would receive these, our offerings, with our gratitude and multiply them for the work of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I believe the children's choir is coming.
okay. And bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The second reading comes from the New Testament. It is Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and is on page 947. A living sacrifice. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy word. Thank you, Sharon. All right, so a um, couple of little notes before we get started today. Typically, I, I like to do what's called expository preaching. I like to look at a text and kind of mine the, the, the goodness out of a text of Scripture. But every now and again, it is appropriate for us to step, take a step back and look at kind of what Scripture says about a topic kind of across the scope of what the Bible teaches. So we take all these individual texts and we try and systematize them and make sense of them. Uh, and that, I think, becomes particularly important with something like what we've been studying last week and will, Lord willing, continue to study this next week. Because it is not uncommon for a chaplain or someone in ministry to have a well-meaning, sincere and devout Christian come to them and say, chaplain, pastor, I, I got a choice to make and I don't know what to do. I can you help me sort through this? And sometimes we get ourselves twisted up in knots. Now, the other part, part that I want to make clear about, and I'm going to reemphasize this a little bit later in uh, the, the sermon today, is this is a, this is a, a, um, a topic that is addressed to believers, right? This is not about how to become a Christian. This is about how to live the Christian life once you already have that saving faith in Christ, right? So we're, we're past that entry point. This is the ethics that come about as a result of what God has already done to, through you in, or to, in, in you in salvation and is doing in you through the process of sanctification. Does that all make sense? Okay. So we're in the second week of a series on the will of God. What is it? What isn't it? How do I know it? And how do I know that I know it? And what happens if I miss it? What happens if I screw it up? And last week we talked briefly about my college friend. Her name was Steffi. She was from Germany, who had been offered two different jobs teaching at small Christian schools, one in Missouri and one in California, and she was sort of paralyzed by this decision because she didn't feel like God had revealed his will to her in this matter. And she was terrified that if she got it wrong, she was somehow going to undermine God's plan for her whole life. And she believed, as many of us sometimes instinctively do, or we've somehow picked up through our Christian culture, that God's will for my life is like this, this broken and dim path through a dark forest. And that forest has got, it's full of wolves and, and all kinds of hidden dangers. And if I step off the, the path, which we have a hard time seeing to begin with, then the wolves are going to get me. You ever felt like that? And we do this because we believe, rightly or wrongly, that God's will for me can only be one thing. It's very narrow, it's very constrictive, and if I get it wrong, then I've screwed it up and I have no option but to suffer the consequences because God is, you know, a tyrant like that. So we freeze, and we don't dare make a choice 
We don't dare choose California over Missouri until God shows us clearly what he wants. Like the shaft of light is going to shine down on a map you have on your wall on California and angels are going to sing and you go, oh, that's the one I'm supposed to take. But how do I know which one that he want, does he wants? Because I've never had that moment. Have you? So I promised you last week we were going to start to deal with those, science, those sorts of questions a little bit starting this week because last week what we did is lay a foundation for the rest of the discussion. Last week we studied Genesis 1 and 2 and the stories of how and why God created people to begin with. God created us for the purpose of, it's a very important purpose. He created us to, to bear his image and that constitutes God's will for us. God created his humanity to be his image bearers, and we discussed what a high calling that that actually is. We are God's three-dimensional physical image bearers on earth. We house the Spirit of God if we're in right relationship with him, whom he breathed into Adam when God made him. We represent God wherever we go, and we rule over the earth as benevolent caretakers of the earth. And this is why God gives us the cultural mandate to be fruitful, to increase in number and fill the earth and rule over it, because wherever we are, the Spirit of God is also. At least that is the plan before we fall into sin, and then we have to deal with that not-so-little obstacle to God's will for us. See, our sin mars our understanding. It distorts the image of God. It doesn't kill it. Everyone bears the image of God, but it is distorted by our sin. It messes up our ability to understand what it is God wants from us, which is why we sometimes struggle with these sorts of questions. Who should I marry? What college do I go to? What job should I take? And we find ourselves, like Steffi, desperately wanting to do the right thing, desperately wanting to do God's will, but lacking any definitive ability to determine what God's will is because sin has clouded our ability to see and understand it. And then, ironically, uh, sometimes we complicate the problem by reading the Bible. Or, or rather yet, I should say, by how we read the Bible. See, one of the mistakes we often make when we read Scripture incorrectly is that we start to think that the extraordinary should be every day, should be commonplace. By that, I mean sometimes each of us has wanted that burning bush, right? That shaft of light from heaven. Or we want a vision from God to tell us what to do. We want direct orders from God to go build an ark and go to Nineveh, or, or, or build an ark or go to Nineveh. Those are two separate stories. Um, or, or tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Make it simple, right? At least we all think we want that. I don't want that. Because every time God appears to a specific individual in Scripture with specific instructions for that person, it usually spells a lot of trouble for that guy. It, it's usually because God has a difficult mission for him. And what if I don't like the instructions God gives me, like Jonah? I get swallowed by a fish if I run away? And even if I don't run, maybe I end up wandering in the desert for 40 years, like Moses, because of stuff other people have done. Or, or I, I get imprisoned and beheaded like Paul, or I get tortured and thrown to the bottom of a well like Jeremiah. Sounds like a good time. So while on the one hand, we all want the security of knowing precisely what God wants from me, most of us don't want anything to do with the responsibilities or consequences of that, that that knowledge would require of us. So right now, let me comfort you. I want, I want, to, I want to say something to you that I hope will be a, a source of, of comfort to you. Relax. You're not that important. Now, that is not to say that you are not of incomprehensible value or worth. That's why God sent Christ to die for us. But I'm confident in saying that for most of us, most of the time, God's eternal plan for the ages doesn't hinge on you. Think of it this way. Throughout human history, how many people have known, loved, and served God? 
Hundreds of thousands, at a minimum, right? And remember, we're not just talking about since the church was founded. We're talking about since creation and all the people of ancient Israel and Judah. So millions, maybe billions of people have been God's people. How many of them did God appear to face to face or in a burning bush or in a vision or a dream? I don't know, right? In the Bible, maybe a few dozen, a couple hundred. And I'm not talking about God's appearance at Mount Sinai where the whole nation of Israel uh, uh, saw him. But remember, even then, the Israelites were so scared, like our call to worship said this morning. They said, hey, Moses, you go up and deal with that. We're going to hang out back here. You relay that information to us. And even if God appears to individuals uh, outside the record of Scripture, it's still a very small number of people to whom God speaks directly and gives specific instructions. And most of us never experience that. And that is okay. That's why we have Scripture. And so this is also crucial. In the Bible, even when God does speak directly to people, it is never, so far as I've been able to find, strictly for that person's personal benefit. God never appears to Jeremiah and says, go down to the 7-Eleven and buy a lottery ticket. These are the numbers I want you to, to play, just because I want you to have $150 million because I like you so much. Just doesn't happen. When God does speak to an individual with specific instructions, those instructions are always related to the advancement of God's plan and the preservation of God's people and the expansion of God's kingdom. It is for the benefit of all God's children, not just the individual who hears from God. And so we, we do this sometimes. We wait for a sign from God to tell us what to do. Like Steffi, we sit there, we wait for a definitive word from God about California or Missouri, believing that God's going to speak precisely to me and simply for the benefit of that decision. But, but usually God doesn't do that. He's not going to tell you which school to attend any more than he's going to give you lottery numbers. And as a norm, God doesn't reveal himself to individuals for their own benefit. And expecting him to, I believe, is more akin to fortune telling and divination than it is to biblical faith. See, because understanding God's will is for us is something different than that. Now again, I'm going to revisit a point I made at the beginning. Point of clarification. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. Being a good person, as we're going to talk about here in a little bit, doesn't make you a Christian. You can't do God, I can't do God's will enough to save me. Salvation is a gift from God based on faith in the death and resurrection of Christ as an atoning sacrifice for my sin. That is absolutely foundational. I can't do the will of God. I cannot be in the will of God unless I am first saved by Christ. The Christian faith isn't about being a good person. The Christian faith is about placing your faith in the saving sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can't be a good person, a good enough person, to earn salvation. However, once I have placed my faith in Christ and I have been saved and my relationship with God is restored, then as a faithful disciple, I will want to do the will of God. Or rather, to be the kind of person God desires me to be, enables me to be through the blood of Christ and through the internal working of the Holy Spirit to sanctify me. Does that make sense? Okay. So in light of that, our first text today is, uh, is going to assume that truth. It comes from the book of Romans. And Romans, of course, is a book Paul writes to the young believers in the church of Rome to explain to them what God has done for them through Jesus. Now, that's the important part, right? Paul is writing to believers, not telling them how to get saved, but rather explaining the implications and the outworking of their salvation. Because of what God has done, how do I now live the Christian life the way God wants me to? In other words, he's going to explain to them how to live out God's will. So in the middle of this explanation about how to live the Christian life rightly, Paul says this in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 of his letter to the church in Rome. <clears throat> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing 
you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul says it is possible to know God's will. It is something we can discern. But he says that first, there are a couple of prerequisites. Before we can know God's will, we must first have a transformed mind. We must think differently. This, he, and he, he contrasts the idea of the transformed mind against conformity to the pattern of the world. Now, he's not talking here about the physical world of like trees and oceans and dogs and you know, paper airplanes. He's talking about the lifestyle and the worldview of this present evil age that is in rebellion against the rule of God. He's talking about a worldview that says, I want to do things my way. I'm going to self-actualize. I'm going to find myself and I'm going to live my truth. This is the way in which godless people view the world and their role in it. So remember, last week we spoke about God's reason for creating us, right? What was that reason? To bear God's image and bear it well, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But we can only do that if we are first in right relationship with God. Without that relationship, without that proper understanding that God is God and that I am not God, but simply bear his image, then I begin to make the mistake of putting myself on the throne, of worshiping the image rather than the one that it images. I live life as though I run the show, and I cease to bear God's image rightly. I'm suddenly failing at my fundamental reason for existing and at God's will for my life. I think I am in charge. But the biblical understanding teaches that I am not in control. I rule and take care of the earth, not for my own benefit, but because I am God's steward of it. I rule in order to advance his kingdom. So when I start to put God on the throne, when I start to think less of myself and more of God, I start to present my body as a living sacrifice. I start to live for God, I'm now beginning the process of transforming my mind and ending the process of conforming to the world. This is a metamorphosis, that's the word that the scripture uses here. A complete change of how I understand things. I need to understand things the way God understands them. I need to think God's thoughts, I need to speak God's words, I need to perceive how God perceives. Only then can I hope to discern and test and discover and learn and identify what his will for me is in a given situation. Am I explaining that clearly enough? Okay. Now, transformation requires knowledge. How do I learn to think the way God thinks? How do I live out the image of God? So I remember a couple of exams I had in seminary. And when it came to the essay portion of the exam, usually the last couple of questions on the exam, the, the, the questions were so broad and the answers had to be so comprehensive that I was tempted to, you know, like kind of staple my Bible to the back and say, see attached. And I think that there is a sense in which the answer to our question is, is kind of that broad. It's a bit simplistic, but it's kind of that broad. See attached. I believe that the answer to the question is nothing less than what the rest of the Bible teaches us. It's all about. The Bible's kind of the instruction manual, the how-to guide for rightly living out the image of God. And we can and we should spend our lifetime studying and applying what Scripture has to say. <clears throat> but for our purposes today, I think we can look less at some of the specifics. We'll get into some of those next week. Uh, and, and instead try to characterize some of these concepts that the Bible teaches. And, and this is perhaps, I think, the key point to this entire series. All right? This is the hinge point of this, the whole series. The teaching of Scripture about the will of God has more to do with who we are than what we do. I'll say that again. 
The teaching of Scripture about the will of God has more to do with who we are than what we do. God's will, as spelled out in the Bible, is a moral will. This is where it gets very easy to get confused. We think that God wants us to be good people, and that's enough. No, God wants us to be saved. We need to be, we need to be redeemed. But once we do that, we live, that, we live out God's will in pursuit of moral goodness in glorifying him. So God's will is, as spelled out in the Bible, is a moral will. It's not primarily about tasks I'm supposed to accomplish. It has more to do with my character and my righteousness than it does with any individual action or task or circumstance. It has more to do with how I live my life than what I do with it. And there's one uh, passage that I think really characterizes it. It was our scripture reading this morning. The choir sang about it. It comes from the book of Micah. And now what's going on here is that God is speaking through the prophet Micah and he is condemning the people of the nation of Israel for their constant disobedience. They're worshiping idols. They're treating the, the, the poor and disenfranchised with cruelty. And God's really angry about it. And he says to them that I've made it abundantly clear to you what I expect of you. And if you wonder why I'm judging you, it's because you're acting this way when I want you to be doing something else. So Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, the prophet Micah says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? That's all about, hey, is my worship acceptable if I'm not living a godly life? Hmm. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, a little foreshadowing of Christ? No, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? See, God's will in this case is rather broad. Micah is asking God, what, what do you want of us? Sacrifices, even up to my child? And God says, no, 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 no. None of those trappings of worship mean anything if you are not in right relationship with me. In the passage, what is God's desire for Micah and the people? And please note, it has nothing to do with what job you're supposed to take or who you're supposed to marry. It gives instructions about what? The kind of person you are supposed to be in your character. You're supposed to be a person who loves what is just and right. You are to seek to be merciful. You're to walk in humility before the God whose image you bear. Okay, well then, what about something like the Ten Commandments? Don't those give us instructions? Don't they give us rules we've got to follow? Doesn't that teach me what I'm supposed to do in any circumstance? Aren't they a list of things I'm supposed to do and not supposed to do? Well, of course they are. A lot of the Bible is that. There's no denying that at a minimum, the instructions in the Bible are a pretty big list of stuff you should do and stuff you shouldn't do. But I think that these instructions really go deeper than that. I believe these instructions, these commands, are primarily rules about how to be God's image bearer rather than what I'm supposed to do with the big decisions in my life. To illustrate this, let's just read them. Let's look at Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a, a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates. For in, the sixth, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that your Lord your God is giving you. 
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So on the one hand, we can look at the Ten Commandments as a rather constricting list of rules where God, you know, is kind of a grouchy old man in the sky, tells us what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do because, you know, he's kind of a prude. But on the other hand, we can see them as guidance from God about what he desires for us to be in our character because we're supposed to reflect his. They teach us about who God is and who we are as his servants and his image bearers. They teach us how we're to interact with our fellow image bearers. As our creator, God is, as our creator, I'm sorry, God is to hold the primary place in our lives. And we as his image bearers are not to worship anything but him or disrespect his name. God doesn't want us to take, uh, God wants us to take some downtime and not work ourselves to death because that's what he did after six days of creation. And if we image him, we should do the same as a way of acknowledging that he and not our labors are the source of our provision. We need to honor our parents. We shouldn't destroy our fellow image bearers by, you know, murdering them. We should be faithful to our spouses. We shouldn't steal what belongs to other people. We should be honest and content with what God has provided for us. So do you see how these commandments are less about what we should do and more about who we should be? And the more you study the commandments found in the Bible, we're going to look at some of these in some, some specificity next week, the more we see that ultimately they're mostly like that. They're about moral living, about growing in godliness. They're not about the decisions that I make. But they do and they must inform the decisions that I make. So I want to make sure that we understand that it's not that God isn't concerned with our questions about who I should marry or what job I should take, as though these, those things don't matter to us or to him. It's just that he is more concerned that as we make those choices, we keep in mind the kind of people he calls us to be. He wants us to make sure we do them for the right reasons, with the right motives. God's will is that we know him, that we live lives worthy of him, and we grow in righteousness. So when we ask these questions that Steffi was asking, California or Missouri, which one is God's will? You know, I think we're looking at things wrongly. For most of us, God isn't going to reveal to us and speak in an audible voice with a roadmap for our lives or with winning lotto numbers or a clear-cut decision about what job to take. Instead, he's revealed his will for us in the roadmap of his word. And his will is about who he wants us to be, not about what choice I need to make in any particular circumstance. So I think Steffi could have chosen either job and still been within God's will. God isn't concerned with what job I take, isn't as concerned with what job I take, my job, my job just happens to be the context in which I do God's will. God's desire for my life is that I belong to him, that I, I live my life in relationship with him, and that I become more like him in my character. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it faithfully in the name of the Lord. As it says in Colossians, do it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. is the Lord Christ you're serving. So we're going to wrap it up here for today, but we are not done with this topic. Uh, as I said earlier, God's will for us is primarily about our growing in godliness and Christlikeness, and only secondarily about an, any, any individual task. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't care about the choices that we make. It's not like those things don't matter. Uh, in fact, they're extremely important because they're the questions that get us, you know, all worked up and bothered. More than that, they're the context in which we actually live out God's will and learn to apply God's will in a world that is in desperate need of light. So next week, we're going to talk about a model for how to apply God's moral will to the decisions that we face. Last week was about a foundation. This week is, I think, I hope, about a shift in perspective in thinking about God's will. And then next week we'll be applying what we've learned to the real world, 
uh, some of those big life-changing decisions that we really care about, that impact us where we are. And that's how we'll close out the series. But for now, I think we can, we can sum up today's discussion this way. What is God's will? Be God's. Be his. Belong to him. Serve him with all your heart. Do justice. Love mercy. Transform your mind so that you can test and discern what is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Father God, it is a relief to think that I don't have to know the right answer to every riddle that I face. It is hard enough to submit ourselves to your will and the sanctification you bring through your Holy Spirit. So Lord, teach us to rest in you, to look to you, and to trust that your grace is sufficient even if we make a mistake. And if we seek to become like you in all that we are, that you, in your faithfulness, will accomplish that. Not because we deserve it, but because of who you are in your character. Teach us to seek you with all that we are so that we may glorify your name. We pray these things in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Now I'm asking you to stand, and uh, as you're able, we're gonna, our closing hymn for the day is hymn number 139, Great is Your Faithfulness.
And now, my friends, receive the blessing. May you rest assured in the knowledge that through the shed blood and resurrection of Christ, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, you have all that you need to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God, to have a transformed mind that enables you to test and discern what is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And now, my friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To God be the glory both now and forevermore. The service is ended. Go in peace. Amen.